Hey, welcome back to Project Build, where today we're making shaker style face cabinets for the kitchen. I really like the look of shaker style cabinets, so I designed my own to be very simple, building them using pocket hole joinery and not requiring a data stack. The cabinet is a standard 34 and 1 half inches tall and 24 inches deep. The 34 and a half inch height is achieved by having a base that's 3 and a half inches tall, a bottom plate that's 3 fourths of an inch, and 30 and 1 fourth inch side panels. The toe kick sits back three inches from the edge, only on the front edge for a standard cabinet, but on both the front edge and the exposed edge for an end cabinet. The only thing that might change from cabinet to cabinet is the width. These cabinets are 24 inches wide, but you can vary the width based on what you need for your space. That's enough background, let's get building. I started making the cabinets by rough cutting a sheet of 3 fourths inch plywood down into a 48 by 30 and a half inch section using a circular saw and a clamping straight edge. I took that section to the table saw, trimmed it down to 30 and a fourth inches, and cut it into two 24 by 30 and a fourth inch pieces, which will be the two sides of my cabinet. I also cut out a 24 by 24 inch square, which will be the bottom plate of my cabinet. So what we want to do now is come to the back and cut a groove on the back of the cabinet that's a fourth inch deep and it's about three eighths wide starting from this inside edge. So what that allows us to do is take a sheet of one fourth inch plywood. We'll be able to slide it into the back here and it'll be flush with every edge. Since all three pieces have a depth of 24 inches, to make this cut easy, I set my saw fence to 24 inches and clamped a scrap piece of the one fourth inch material that I'm using for the back panel to the fence. Doing this offsets the cut by the thickness of the back panel material so that I get a perfect fit and I don't have to worry about measuring. The groove goes about 3 8 of an inch into the side of the panel and that's what the blade height is set to. I'm not using a dado stack to do this so I made multiple passes moving the fence over slightly in between each cut. We got all the slots cut for our back panel here. So now what I want to do is build the base that goes underneath the bottom plate of the cabinet. So what I've done is I've cut three and a half inch strips of plywood and from that I've made the pieces for our base. On the underside of the base plate I marked a line set back three inches for the toe kick. This is an end cabinet so it has a toe kick set back on both the front edge of the cabinet and the edge that will be the exposed end. A non-end cabinet would only have the toe kick on the front edge. I drilled several pocket holes in each of the four base pieces so that it could be screwed into the bottom plate of the cabinet, and then two holes in each end of the pieces that span the width of the cabinet so I could screw them into the pieces that go front to back. I clamped the first piece up against the line using a square block as an assist and screwed it into the base plate. I did the same for the other sections, screwing the base strips together where necessary. You might notice that I cut a minor corner for the exposed corner edge of the base, but that was unnecessary as there will be a toe kick plate covering that toe kick once the cabinet is installed and that corner won't even actually be visible. I just wasn't thinking ahead. On the base strip that goes across the back of the cabinet, make sure to screw it with the pocket holes on the outside so that the screws angle towards the front of the cabinet. If you screw it with the holes angle towards the back, the screws will stick through into the groove we cut for the back panel. Can you guess how I learned that one? Now it was time to attach the side panels. I drilled pocket holes in the side of the panel spaced about four inches apart, then put wood glue on the bottom edge and spread it with a glue brush. I stood the panel up, making sure the groove side was facing the back, and clamped it in place using a block to assist on the back. On the front corner, I'm using a right angle clamp to hold the panel perpendicular to the base, and once it was clamped securely, I attached the side panel using pocket screws. I then repeated the same thing for the other side. Normally the pocket holes would be hidden on the outside of the panel, but this is an exposed edge of an end cabinet and the trim won't cover those holes, so it's better to put them on the inside and plug them, which I'll do later in the video. Next I added four stretchers to strengthen the cabinet and keep it square. These were made out of two and a half inch strips of plywood cut to 22 and a half inches to span the inner width of the cabinet. Each stretcher has two pocket holes in each end. The first stretcher is installed down from the top 3 fourths of an inch and flush with the edge of the groove we cut so that the back panel can go on top of it. I used a lot of clamps to hold this stretcher in place as it would be really easy for the cabinet to get out of square while installing it. The next stretcher is installed on top of the previous one and I drilled countersunk and screwed in two screws to hold these stretchers together. I added the third stretcher flush with the top edge of the front of the cabinet. The center of the last stretcher is installed 24 inches up from the bottom edge of the base plate so that the doors and drawer face both overlay the stretcher face. And with that installed, we've made a box. Woo! So what I gotta do now is install edge banding to all these exposed plywood edges here. Then it'll make it a nice clean surface that'll look good on its own, but also will be ready for painting. 
I'm going to be using 13 16 inch birch edge banding here. If birch has a smooth grain that paints well, you want to use edge banding that is slightly wider than your plywood so that it overlaps both edges and can easily be trimmed flush. To install the edge banding, I first sanded with 120 grit sandpaper to prepare the edge surface to grip the adhesive on the edge banding. I then cut a piece with scissors that's slightly longer than the length of the plywood that I want to attach it to. I heated the edge banding by running an iron with no water in it set to the cotton setting, down it making sure that the edge banding overlapped both edges of the plywood, and while it was still warm, I used the edge of a wooden block to press the adhesive down into the plywood. Next, I trimmed the excess edge banding using a banding trimmer. This trimmer was really nice because it can trim both sides at once, but you can also take it apart and do one side at a time if needed. I trimmed off most of the excess overhanging the end with scissors and then used one side of the trimmer to cut it flush. I recommend starting this cut on one side and then finishing it from the other so that the banding doesn't tear out. Learn that one the hard way. I cleaned up any of the edges that I couldn't reach with the banding trimmer with the utility knife. I also trim where the banding crossed the other plywood edges using a speed square and the utility knife. I really should have banded the plywood before assembling the cabinet. That would have made this way faster and easier. I took 120 grit sandpaper and sanded the banded edges slightly to blend them with the rest of the plywood. Then you just repeat the same process for all the other plywood edges. As a quick note, it's a good idea to use a different iron for edge banding than you do for your clothes as you wouldn't want to chance getting the adhesive from the edge banding on your clothes. And with that, we're done with the edge banding. So now we gotta add the backs to these cabinets. And then on this end cabinet where these pocket holes are inside here, I've gotta fill these pocket holes in with plugs. I'm gonna fill the pocket holes first so I can get to these ones from the back before we put that panel on. For plugging pocket holes, you can buy plugs that look like this, or you can buy a plug cutter, but that's about $80 and I don't have one. And I didn't wanna go buy one. So what I did is I actually just made my own plugs. Kind of like this. So I'm going to show you how to do that real quick. For that, get a scrap piece of wood. This is just a scrap piece of plywood. And I've drilled a normal pocket hole in it. And then I've punched out the end. There's a hole here. And then what I can do is I can just clamp it to a work surface. And then I have a 3 8 inch wooden dowel that I bought at the store for about a dollar. And I cut a 25 degree angle on the end here with the miter saw. Because that's pretty close to what the plugs you can buy come with. And then what I can do is slide this into the hole push it down all the way until it stops. And then using a flush cut blade on a multi-tool or actually just using a hand flush cut blade, I can cut this off. Then you just take something like an Allen wrench and put it into the hole down here and pop this plug out. And look at that, we made our own plug. You can get another one by taking this dowel back to the miter saw and then cutting a 25 degree angle this way. So it matches up with this. From there, you're basically back to step one. You can just repeat as many times as you need for as many plugs as you need. It's pretty easy, and it was a lot cheaper than buying a plug cutter. So it works for me. I put some wood glue on the back of a plug and pushed it in. I tried to use a plastic hammer to tap the plugs in, but I had some trouble with this, so I used a flathead screwdriver to drive them in. This leaves a little dent in the plug, but that gets filled in and sanded out later. I cut a 23 and a fourth by 30 and a half inch panel out of 1 fourth plywood to fit into the groove we made on the back of the cabinet. I put the right angle clamps back on the front of the cabinet to hold it square and laid it down on top of a 2 by 4 to protect the front edge. I put wood glue on the groove and back stretcher and brushed it on. Then I laid the panel in place, making sure to put the good side down towards the inside of the cabinet and shot a bunch of 5 8 inch brad nails around the edges to hold it in place. So I got the back on this end cabinet here and now it's time to start trimming this out to actually make this look good and then cover this explosive plywood edge that's down here. To do that, I'm going to use 1 fourth by 2 and a fourth pieces for both the styles and the rails here. I made my own and I'm going to show you quickly how I did that. But you can buy one fourth inch stock at the store and then rip it to size if you don't have the tool to do it the way that I did it. I ripped two and a fourth inch pieces out of a clear pine one by eight and I can get three widths of trim from one board. I then ripped each of those two and a fourth pieces in half widthwise, leaving each piece about five sixteenths of an inch thick. I'm using a magnetic feather board to keep the board up against the fence and it's really an invaluable tool for making precise rip cuts. I then took the strips, marked a bunch of X's on the factory edge so I'd always know that that was the backside no matter what length I cut the trim to, and then I planed them down to one fourth of an inch making sure that the X outside was down so that the side with saw marks got smoothed out by the planer. I cut two 31 inch styles out of my trim pieces, added glue to the backside, and shot 5 8 inch brad nails to hold them in place, making sure that the trim was flush with both the top edge and the vertical edge of the cabinet. Once those styles were in place, I cut, glued, and nailed in the rails in between them. It's amazing what a difference a little bit of trim can make. 
The cabinet was built, but I needed to prepare it for painting. I started by sanding the pocket hole plugs flush with the plywood using 150 grit sandpaper on my orbital sander. I then filled all the imperfections on the cabinet. I used a putty knife to apply a layer of wood filler over the pocket hole plugs and used my finger to fill in the brad nail holes in the trim. Once all the filler had dried, I sanded everything smooth using 150 grit on my orbital sander. Prior to painting, I came back and sanded all the visible cabinet surfaces with 220 grit. This base cabinet is pretty much done other than just painting it. Now we gotta make the doors and the drawers. For a shaker style door, you're normally gonna have a 3 4 inch frame that goes around. There's gonna be a groove cut on the inside and then a panel that sits inside that. That's actually not what I've done here. That would have been a little bit harder to build and I wanted to keep this really simple. So what I've done is I've taken a piece of half inch plywood, I've added trim around the front, and then I put edge banding on it all the way around and sanded it down so that it looks seamless. And I wasn't sure this was gonna work out, but really happy with how this turned out. And it's pretty easy to make. I cut out two 11 and 13 16 by 23 and 7 8 from half inch plywood. My cabinets are 24 inches wide and I want two doors with the 1 16th inch reveal on the outside of each door and a 1 8th inch gap between the doors. While it's very thin, I also had to account for the thickness of the edge banding, which is 1 32nd of an inch on both edges of the door, adding 1 16th inch total to each door's width. For the door height, I needed them to be 1 16th of an inch less than the 24 inch center line on the front stretcher, minus the 1 16th total width of the edge banding. The process to add the trim to the doors is just like adding the trim to the side of the end cabinet except for one thing. When shooting brads into the styles I had to be aware of where the door hinge holes were going to be drilled on the back of the door and make sure not to put any brads in that area. Once all the trim was attached I ironed on and trimmed the edge banding around the door edge. I saved a bit of time by using my belt sander to smooth the rough edges instead of doing it by hand. It took a little bit of practice to sand off just the right amount, but this really sped things up. I filled and sanded all the brad holes and the trim seams just like before using 150 grit sandpaper and then coming back and sanding the whole door with 220 grit. Then I repeated the process and made a whole bunch of doors. I needed to drill holes for the hinges, but this is my first time using these hinges. So I made a test door out of scrap plywood, and once I was confident in my offsets, I clamped a hinge hole jig, centering the hole three and a half inches from the edge of the door, and drilled out the hinge hole. I then drilled two holes for the hinge screws using painter's tape as a depth indicator on my drill bit. Did the same for the other door hinge, and we've got ourselves a completed door. With all our doors made, I went ahead and made drawer faces too. This drawer face is made pretty much just like the door. The only difference is the rails here are thinner than the styles are. The general rule that I found is that if the drawer face is seven inches or less in height, then you wanna make the rails thinner. And I made my rails one and five inches thick. If your drawer face is five inches or less, then you wanna make a solid slab. I made my cabinet drawers entirely out of maple plywood so that they wouldn't need to be painted. The cabinet drawer opening is five and seven eighths by 22 and a half wide. And in general, I made drawers an inch shorter than that drawer opening. So this is four and seven eighths tall. The drawer slides for the cabinet also need half an inch each. The width of the drawer is 21 and a half inches. The front and back pieces of the drawer are 20 inches wide and they're screwed into these two 22 inch long side pieces using pocket holes that are hidden by the back of the cabinet and by the drawer front. The side pieces also cover the edges of the front and back plywood so that the only edge banding that needs to be done is the top edge. There's a piece of 1 4 inch maple plywood that's slotted into the bottom edge of all the drawer pieces. All right, let's make a drawer. I ripped a bunch of five inch wide boards out of 3 4 inch maple plywood and later recut them to four and seven eighths inches when they were manageable strips. Ripping in the longer direction of the plywood is more difficult, but it makes the grain pattern run in the direction that a real maple board would. I also cut the boards off screen to the right length on my miter saw. I got help from my assistant Brady, as I don't yet have in-feed or out-feed tables to do this by myself. To add a groove for the bottom panel, I set my table saw blade height to 1 4 of an inch using a scrap piece of my trim as a guide, and then I cut a slot 3 8 of an inch up from the edge in all four drawer pieces. I then marked where the top edge of the drawer bottom would be relative to that first cut and cut that out on all the drawer slides. I later made one more pass through all the drawer pieces through the middle of those two cuts just to clean out the remaining wood that's in that groove. I drilled three pocket holes in the ends of the outside front and back drawer pieces and then put maple edge banding on the top edge of all four pieces. The drawer bottom was cut out of 1 4 inch maple plywood, 3 8 longer and wider than the inner dimensions of the drawer box. To assemble the drawer, I put a few drops of wood glue in each of the grooves just to keep the bottom panel from moving around and rough fit all the pieces together. I then clamped both sides in place and screwed the whole thing together with pocket screws. And just like that, we've made a drawer. 
Our cabinet is built. We're done making the doors and drawer faces, and now we're ready to paint. I started by priming all the doors and drawer faces. I used a brush to get into all the corners and then came back with a foam roller to leave an even finish on everything. Once I was finished priming the doors, I did the same for the inside and outside of the cabinet. After the primer dried, I lightly sanded everything with 320 grit sandpaper to get rid of any of the rough spots and then put the first coat of paint on everything using a blue for the doors and outside of the cabinets and white for the insides. I use semi-gloss Alkid paint for the cabinets. It takes longer to dry and much longer to cure than latex paint, but it cures to a very hard surface that should be significantly more durable, making a great choice for cabinets. Painting everything using a brush and roller was very tedious, particularly the doors. I'm definitely going to be trying out a sprayer to speed this up in the future. Once the inside had dried, I taped off the cabinets and painted the face frame blue. I later added a second coat of paint to everything, and I was done painting. We're done painting and now we get to do the best part of this whole project. We're going to put the drawers in, put the doors on, and put all the hardware on, and we'll be done. Oh, we're so close. To mount the drawer, I first took out the inner slide that attaches to the drawer and set that aside. I clamped a drawer slide jig to hold the slides in place while mounting them. The cabinet stretcher gets in the way of the jig here, so I attached a scrap piece of plywood to the jig using double-sided tape to make it match the stretcher height. I put the slide flush with the front of the cabinet and marked the long horizontal slots. I punched the centers of the marked slots with a spring-loaded center punch and pre-drilled the screw holes. I screwed in the slide starting at the back, making sure that the slide was flush with the front before putting the other three screws, and repeated for the slide on the other side. Looking good! Next, I needed to attach the inner slides that I pulled out earlier to the sides of the drawer. I set the slide on some of my 1 4 inch trim so that the drawer would sit just a little bit above the stretcher when it was installed, maximizing drawer clearance. This slide is installed just like the outer slide. Mark the holes, punch and pre-drill them, and screw in the slide, keeping it flush with the front of the drawer. To install the door, I screwed the hinges to the door and then attached the mounting plates to the hinges. I then held the door in place flush with the bottom edge of the cabinet and marked the center of the mounting plates. The height of these marks are accurate, but the offset from the front of the cabinet might not be. So I made a template that has a slot cut for the middle of the hinge and two holes 37 millimeters back from the front edge. I put the template up flush with the cabinet front so I could see the mark I made in the center of the slot and mark the two screw holes. Then I punched the marks, pre-drilled, and screwed in the mounting plate. I'm sensing a theme here. I did the same for the other hinge, attached the door to the mounting plates, and then installed the other door the same way. These hinges can adjust in three directions and I set them in line with the cabinet edges and used a scrap piece of 1 8 polycarbonate to get the spacing between the doors right. I slotted the drawer into the slides. I put some double sided tape on the front of the drawer, put my 1 8 spacer on top of the doors, and lined up the drawer front before pushing it all together so the tape would hold it in place. I pre-drilled, countersunk, and drove in two 1 inch screws flush with the back of the drawer to hold the drawer front in place permanently. The pools I used have mounting holes 3 inches on center apart, so I used a template to mark a center line at 4 inches from the top of the door so that the top screw hole of the door pool would be 2.5 inches from the top of the door. I set my door hole jig so that the holes would be drilled in the middle of my trim and put the center line of the jig on my mark. I clamped it in place and drilled out the holes using my template as a backing plate to prevent blowout and screwed on the door pull. Installing the drawer pull is pretty similar. I marked the center of the drawer and then used a little piece of trim to both extend the center line and to be a spacer under the jig. I set the depth of the jig halfway down the drawer face, drilled out the holes, and screwed on the pull. And that's it. We are done making these base cabinets. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and let me know what you thought down in the comment section. And be sure to subscribe so you won't miss any of my kitchen remodel or all the things I'm going to be making in the future. Thanks for watching. I'll see y'all next time.